Good afternoon, dear colleagues. It's a great pleasure meeting you here in Iceland again, finally, physically. Today uh, we are going to discuss a very interesting topic uh, which uh, connects the Arctic and space, a topic which has not been that thoroughly discussed. We are discussing about the volcano eruption which took place uh, a couple of months ago. And that was on the March, of 19th, March 19th uh, in the Geldingadal Valley, where the Fakradals fell in Iceland on the Reykjanes Peninsula. And during the four weeks prior to this event, there had been intense seismic activity, tens of thousands of earthquakes, and substantial ground deformation, leading monitoring scientists to expect that an eruption would be imminent. Although ground deformation observations from interferometric synthetic aperture radar analysis pointed to a magmatic intrusion, it remained unclear where and when exactly an eruption would take place, how much lava would be extruded and in what direction it would flow. As with all natural disasters, making scientifically sound predictions for risk mitigation is as critically important as it's challenging. Ice -Eye University of Iceland and Icelandic Meteorological Office and Iceland Space Agency joined forces to respond and have put together a study on the aftermath of the event. Today we have a great panel discussing this uh, execution which, we have take, which has taken place within the past couple of months. Keynote will be given by Shay Strong, who is the VP of Analytics with IceEye. He's, she's a PhD in astronomy from uh, the University of Austin, a specialist in remote sensing and imagery and satellite and aerial expert. Freistin Sigmundsson, uh, he's from uh, um, the Nordic Volcanological Center from the University of Iceland, a research professor in the Institute of Earth and Sciences and head of faculty of the Earth Sciences. We have Dr. Vincent Druin, he's a geophysicist in the Icelandic Meteorological Office and Mr. Daniel Leib, who is the founding partner and executive mission director from Iceland Space Agency. With that, uh, I'll leave the floor to Shay to give our keynote. Please, Shay, welcome. Hello, and thank you. It's lovely to see all of you here today. Um, I wanted to just dive right in, at the risk of being a little redundant with the title again, the volcano is definitely erupting, or was erupting, in the case of Fagradasviat. So where I wanted to start is just fundamentally, we've been able to create this incredible collaboration across these different organizations. Um, that through the, the collaboration itself, we were able to evaluate not only just the extent of this particular event, um, but also the magnitude from space, and then fuse it with in situ ground measurements obtained here in Iceland. And perhaps very unique because of this fusion, we were able to, for perhaps the first time, get a fundamentally clear understanding of what the dynamics of this geophysical event implied, as well as what was happening in kind of the subterranean plumbing of, of this volcano. And unique, of course, to that is not alone just the scientific implications of, of being able to have high frequency, high revisit content um, but also the implications that it has on human risk and the, the people that are potentially impacted by these kinds of events. So all in all, over the 26 days of this particular eruption, uh, seven new eruptive fissures were identified. Um, and from a space-based perspective, the, the, the platform that was used is ISIS SAR satellites. This is a synthetic aperture radar active sensing uh, sensor. Um, which enables us to probe precise uh, estimates of the depth um, of the, the, the um, sorry, the deformation of the ground itself. And so kind of a, a beautiful eye candy picture that's a bit representative of that and uh, is this interferogram that's draped over a three-dimensional image of the volcanic surface. Um, and one thing that is really unique about SAR is Assuming that you can maintain a perfect consistency from day to day to day uh, on the image capture side, you can build what is called these coherent stacks that ultimately allows us to look at this millimeter level deformation of the Earth's surface, which is fundamentally a very valuable thing to observe when it comes to the volcanic activity alone. 
And so what you're looking at here, it's, this is a, the interferogram is showing these kind of rings, kind of concentric rings isolated around where the volcanic, the most of the volcanic activity occurred. And each of those rings is approximately 1.55 centimeters in depth of deformation of the surface. Um, and then again, just to, in case you're not familiar with the, the radar technology itself, because it's an active sensor, we're able to see through uh, a lot of weather phenomenology. So, um, uh, of course, uh, haze or, or clouds no longer are a problem for synthetic aperture radar, especially in this X-band uh, microwave wavelength. Um, and it being an active system, it does not require the, the solar light to illuminate the surface for capture. So you can do day-night acquisitions, which really is critical when we talk about some of these natural catastrophe events and the impact that they can have on, on society. And so finally, with the combination, it, it's this beautiful coupling and combination of both the, the space-based assets combined with the ground and field measurements, where we can really kind of serve three needs. One is, you know, from an economic perspective and a human risk perspective, understand, you know, where, where the potential impact might lie with respect to these natural catastrophe or geological events. And then from a societal perspective, one of the beautiful things that drove me into the world of uh, remote sensing and then SAR technology is that fundamentally it's physically verifiable. So, so the observations that we collect are something that can be validated by a human from a human perspective. And then environmentally, you know, because of the, the aforementioned re reasons of being able to have a persistent system, we can be incredibly responsive to uh, the changing world and the changing environment, which ultimately creates this really lovely foundational layer to understand you know, how our Earth is changing, especially under the climate stress that it's in today. So with that, I want to turn it back over to Tero, and we'll have our panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jay, for the excellent keynote. And uh, we'll hand it over to the panel now for, for a discussion. So um, as we are aware, ISAID just recently signed uh, the agreement with the European Space Agency for the Copernicus Contributing Mission, and we are a third-party mission member as well. So the data is available for all researchers and research institutes around the world, including Iceland. So, so Vincent, you played a key role uh, in this research uh, and uh, did, did a great study out of uh, what, what happened with the volcano. So um, um, what did we actually learn with the help of SAR interferometry on this one as you have researched volcanoes extensively at the, uh, at the Met Office? So. I think INSAR is one of our main tools nowadays to monitor the formation of a volcano. Because the advantage of like having, like Shay explained, like millimeter or centimeter precision, which is what needed for volcanoes. Really, the deformation is not that significant to many volcanoes prior to eruption. So that's very important. The only other technique that can achieve this precision are really like need instrument on the field, which can be tedious to get there while like a satellite will allow you to measure it directly. So that's what we did basically with uh, this eruption in Fagradal Fiat. Like it was in the middle of an area where we, did, we didn't have any, any other monitoring technique. So ISI started to monitor very precisely the eruptive area. And thanks to that, we could start to see like the, we, have, we could see deformation on the surface and with this deformation, we could invert for like knowing the magma flow path within the crust because the magma go from the depths to the surface and it need to go through conduits. And thanks to this like a high resolution, like a, a few centimeters, like a few tens of centimeter pixels, and also most importantly, the daily acquisition, we could see like individual fissure opening because like there was like seven fissures, the main one, and then secondary that open. And thanks to this data set, we were able to like map precisely where the different, uh, the conduit was for each business, each fissure, and then that can be really useful for like uh, mitigating hazards, because there were a lot of people obviously in the area that uh, like want to see the eruption, so knowing where the next eruption or fissure could happen is really of prime importance. Right, right, exactly, exactly. So, um, Fristin, um, the University of Iceland was uh, a participant uh, in this study as well mm -hmm. and gave a great contribution. Yes. And you have extensive uh, uh, research also in different areas mm -hmm. of, of, of this type. So 
what did you make out of the res this research and uh, how can it help us to understand the volcanoes better? Well, it is uh, actually uh, a new tool we, we have with this satellite constellation. The ISI constellation is very special. Uh, uh, it, we can have this high ray visit time, looking at a, an ongoing eruption every day, and high spatial resolution. And this is what is needed worldwide, really, to, to better understand the, the plumbing system inside volcanoes. Magma goes through a plumbing system, and as Vincent was explaining, it's the ground deformation that's important. One of the things we learned that when these new uh, eruptive craters were opening up, that we, with this tool and, and the approaches, we can map the opening of the conduit. This helps to understand the hazards and the associated risks. It can help to save life. Maybe we need to be more aware that uh, there may be little precursors to opening of these new vents. That is what we learned here. And with this technique, we are also have a, have a very good uh, example of how uh, remote sensing is getting more and more uh, important in the Nordic countries. Radar satellites are really useful uh, in the polar regions where it is dark half of the year because they see through clouds and nights. Um, and there are many uh, important utilization uh, I think can follow uh, where this is just an example of where the ISI satellite constellation is used to understand natural hazards. Thanks. Right, exactly. Uh, so, Daniel, uh, the Iceland Space Agency uh, is our local partner with ISI here, here in Iceland, and uh, you have worked extensively uh, with space research, and uh, uh, you have a dream about going to Mars or even to Venus, that remains to be seen. <laughs> but uh, wh what do you think? Uh, how can the space community make benefit out of the finding, uh, findings and this research? Well, I, I think it's also a wonderful example of how technology that's been developed that's in orbit, uh, uh, above our planet right now is benefiting us most here on, on Earth. And uh, the, the findings um, that, uh, that Vincent, Freysteen, Shea um, are, are sharing today are really exciting because they, they demonstrate that uh, space technology, um, that the ISI constellation uh, is able to, to really peer beneath the surface and uh, so that we can glean more about our own planet and the findings about our own planet ultimately inform what we know and can understand about other planets in our solar system. Right, exactly, exactly. So uh, this has been like uh, a pioneering study uh, and it actually follows greatly the uh, um, ideas of the Arctic Economic Council where the collaboration between the science community and business community is of, is of essential. So, Shay, what's going to happen now? So, uh, this research has been conducted and, uh, uh, and uh, the volcanoes are still erupting around the world. So, what will we do next with this? Yes, no, I, I mean, I think this has been like a, a first great example of this collaboration. And um, we were lucky enough to have a tour of the Icelandic Meteorological Office this morning. And I, I think we, I don't know, I've walked away with additional brainstorming ideas around how can we couple more um, observations of, of various volcanoes. I mean, I, I was a little bit blown away with how many there were here, quite honestly, um, in my naive perception. Uh, <laughs> but then coupled with the, also the, the glacier activity in terms of the, yeah. the melting of the glaciers. I think there's a phenomenal um, capacity to do a lot of comprehensive analysis. So I'm hoping we can continue collaboration. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So, Vincent, what are your uh, further ideas considering uh, uh, the interferometric studies for the, for the volcanoes? So, what's going to be the next steps in this area? Uh, specifically for volcanoes, I guess the main thing will be like, uh, like this spring when we had a lot of earthquake happening, and then we could start to see like that there was a dike on the movement. Then uh, it will be good like next time that we start acquiring images right now, so we could see the magma propagating within the crust on almost near real time, like on a daily basis or sub daily basis, which is really important like for hazard because uh, where the dike is traveling can influence a lot like uh, where the eruption will happen. So that's really the, the next steps. Uh, for me, like will be like the, when the next eruption happen, yeah, we should definitely like try to acquire as many images and it should be even become more as a routine, like kind of a non natural tool for like uh, yeah, monitoring hazard in general, not like a scientific like I'm doing now, but it should be become more like a natural way. We know that there is a situation, we should get this data and so that people can directly see what's happening in real time. Exactly, yeah, yeah. 
So first, what about the university? What's going to happen? What's, what's up with your funding? Because, I mean, research yes. requires funding and what's going to be the next activities in this area with the university? Yeah, those of us that uh, are working on trying to understand volcanoes in the academic environment, we are steadily looking for new techniques, uh, how we can better proceed to, to, to really know what is down there inside a volcano. And the high resolution uh, in space and time allowed by the satellite constellation, I think we need to apply this to, to volcanoes worldwide. It is really about the final ascent of the magma towards the surface where these high resolution observations are important and I see lots of possibilities. And this is actually uh, only available from space. You can't do it uh, with any type of other observation. Perhaps you can use aircrafts and things like that, but if you think of emissions, for instance, uh, it's much more better to the nature yeah. to, to use space in this. Isn't that the case? Often at volcanoes, we need to combine everything we have, ground-based sure. observations, but space missions have a, 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 a huge uh, benefits in terms of uh, no risk for people on the ground. And in this case, like in the ISI, for the ISI satellite constellation, the high resolution uh, in, in space and time is hard to beat with uh, other observations. We would need the whole array of very expensive instruments on the ground to, to get the same amount of information. Exactly, yeah, mm. yeah. I'll soon turn the discussion to, to the audience, but before that, so Daniel, um, with your uh, experience uh, from the field of, field of space, both from Iceland and, and, and United States. What's your uh, next plans uh, with the Iceland Space Agency in this uh, area and uh, how are you going to support uh, this, type of, uh, this type of activity in Mars or in Venus or whatever is going to be your next galaxy? <laughs> well, I, I think part of, the, um, uh, part of our project here in, in Iceland is also making sure that people understand that uh, space exploration, uh, space research, um, isn't limited really to just what's happening out there. It's really about what's happening uh, right down here on, on Earth. And the uh, fantastic research that's been done here really does inform uh, what we know and can understand about other planets in our solar system that also uh, have volcanism, uh, but also uh, how the technology can also be used uh, to better understand uh, global warming. Um, specifically with regards to the, the glaciers here in Iceland. And so I'm, I'm most excited about how the ISI constellation can be used to, uh, to track the, uh, the glacial retreat over time uh, here in Iceland and really inform uh, decisions that can be made to uh, steer us off the, uh, the cliff uh, with, with global warming. Right, exactly, exactly, yeah. Uh, and maybe one final question to Shay before going over to the audience. So. Uh, what's the benefit of uh, the agility of the ISA constellation, uh, perhaps if you look into, you know, what's been in the market five or ten years mm -hmm. ago compared to what's available now? Yeah, I mean, I, I think particularly with the agility of our constellation, with also the phased array design, um, we're able to respond to things like, you know, natural catastrophe events fundamentally, whether it's volcanoes, you know, glacier melt, floods, fires, wh whatever the case is, we have the ability to truly capture the granularity of the time series of the event. And I think, you know, previous to that ability, it, you know, often maybe the best you could do was a week or, you know, it, perhaps you could fly, you know, uh, aerial assets in order to gather high, higher frequency information, but from a space-based perspective, definitely a challenge. So, you know, this really gives us this opportunity to really understand, you know, what is going on in these different domains. Right, as each ISA satellite mm -hmm. goes around the globe 15 times per Correct. day, so yeah. it's a great yeah. frequency. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah.